The media has been very kind to Joe Biden since the Senate passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Maureen Dowd wrote in the New York Times this morning that despite this massive accomplishment, Joe Biden should still opt out of a re-election run in 2024. Hey, Joe, don't give it a go. By Maureen Dowd. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a cautionary tale. Man, she really manages to just repulse you immediately. It's like a James Bond movie, which always starts with a big action sequence. She yeah. always starts. She gets the vomit just yeah. right up here in the first sentence, right? The timing of your exit can determine your place in the history books. This is something Joe Biden should keep in mind as he is riding the crest of success. His inner circle, irritated by stories about concerns over his age and unpopularity, will say this winning streak gives Biden the impetus to run again. The opposite is true. It should give him the confidence to leave, secure in the knowledge that he made his mark. Okay, here's the really nauseating part. He offered himself up as an escape from Trump and Trumpism, a way to help us get our bearings after the thuggish and hallucinatory reign of a con man. Then he and his team got carried away and began unrealistically casting him as an FDR with a grand vision to remake the social contract. I, I, I'm sorry, thuggish and hallucinatory. This, this is the man who challenged someone to a fucking push-up contest in the campaign. <laughs> right. this that is was man who... pretty thuggish and hallucinatory to me. And shakes dog, hands with invisible people, too. Called a dog-faced pony soldier. I, 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 come on, man. That's like a Jim Morrison line. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> dog-faced pony soldiers of dawn. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, but I, I love that. He got carried away and began unrealistically casting himself as an FDR with a grand vision to remake the social contract. Biden's mission was not to be a visionary, but to be a calming force for a country in desperate need of calming and a bridge to the next generation. No, no, no. I'm sorry, Maureen. Don't project your hysterical bullshit onto the entire country. The country did not need calming. You and your pathetically weak and ignorant and stupid readership were the ones who needed calming. The libs were the ones who needed calming because the libs were the ones who were shallow enough to believe that Donald Trump was a unique and existential evil. Everybody who lived through, say, the Bush years remembers what a great time that was. Remember that the, the actual fascists were the Bush Cheney fascists. This Trump version, this was the cartoon version. The alt right, the January 6th, the Hagar, the hell, horrible helmet with the face paint marching into the Capitol. The act we this what this these were the Delta House fascists. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you guys just couldn't take that for reasons which we've gone into a million times on this show. I'm not going to repeat this over and over again. But the idea that the country needed calming after Donald Trump. No, what the country needed was precisely a remaking of the social contract. That's what's so ironic about this op-ed. She says, they got carried away with visions of FDR trying to remake the social contract when really all we needed was to be calmed down. No, it's all the New York Times liberal pussy fucking morons needed was to be calmed down. It's not what the country needed. The country absolutely needs a remaking of the social contract. It needed one a long time ago. That's why Trump won in the first place. But the idea that like, well... Biden just got carried away. Build back better. That was him getting carried away. Once again, they are validating the 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 victory lap that Joe Manchin is being allowed to take here is just nauseating because the liberal media that was on his ass all along, they are now validating all of well, Joe well, Manchin they, and they, Kristen Sinema's well, bullshit. All of it. Because they, they're saying they, this they was the actual writing bill. Those stories. They love writing those stories. And Maureen Dowd was always a cinema fan. Right, she's the one who. Wrote well, she wrote that, that wrote, ridiculous wrote, piece task, about it. Right, yeah. Bad. She is the Greta Garbo. Of this. <laughs> I mean, you should lose your press card just for that line. Right, exactly, exactly. 
But the, I mean, that's what they're doing. They're basically saying Manchin was right all along because this was the bill they really wanted to pass all along. This is the bill the Democrats wanted to pass all along because not only is it a deficit reduction bill, it's a pro-business, pro-fossil fuel bill. But mm -hmm. as Matthew Ho just said a while back, this means they don't have to pass another bill regarding any of these issues for a very long time. For a very long time. It's like, well, the IRA, that was the thing. Just like the ACA in 2009, well, we solved healthcare with the ACA. Now we have to build on that. And by build on that, we mean piss on anybody who actually wants universal healthcare, right? And so that's what this is all set up to do here. And the fact that you have Maureen Dowd now saying, well, you should not seek a second term, uh, not because you suck, but because this is such a crowning achievement, first of all, this IRA is a tough act to follow and you're getting fucking old, right? Has nothing to do with the policy failures of Joe Biden, why Joe Biden is mired in the high 30s, low 40s in terms of his numbers. It's just, hey, ride off into the sunset after passing this bullshit bill and uh, let Pete Buttigieg take it from here. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, they live in a fantasy world where yeah. what they're doing is working and they, they don't really care what the peasants think. The, the, no. the, the, the voters are an unfortunate thing that they have to deal with, but really you always get between the lines of how people like Maureen Dowd write about the public and write about the voters. The voters are an unfortunate afterthought. Really? Well, in this if, case, if only we didn't have to deal with these stupid voters we could solve everything really that's what they truly think absolutely and in this piece notice the voters don't even enter into her thinking here that was the other thing i was going to mention about this phrasing here he and his team got carried away and began unrealistically casting him as an fdr in other words this vision of joe biden as an fdr was not born of a public need for a new new deal was not born of a public demand that we have a new FDR. It was born of his personal vision of being an FDR Democrat in terms of him securing his legacy. It's all told from the perspective right. of the elite class. Right. She doesn't mention why, hey, it wasn't just that he wanted to be the next FDR. In fact, he really didn't want to be the next FDR, but for the fact that he felt pressure to sort of be an FDR or an LBJ because he knew that the times uh, called for that. Joe Biden has no vision of being the next. Well, are, are you kidding there, me? Were, there was, I mean, with Joe Biden, there, there's like, there, he's like Nixon, but a lot less complex, interesting, and intelligent. Um, <laughs> he, he, has, he has a lot of Nixonian resentments. You know, not being taken seriously by the others because he didn't go to the right schools and he didn't come out of the Ivy League and he's he came from a poor family and had to work his way up. He has a lot of those Nixonian uh, dramas going on. And I, I believe he did want to do really big legislation because he it, it, it's it's a Nixon of the left. He, he wants to do these big social policies in order to secure his legacy. And actually Nixon himself did go in that direction. He's the, he, he's the one who created the EPIA and he was talking about uh, creating a UBI. And he proposed a healthcare bill that was more generous than Obamacare. Ted Kennedy rejected it because he felt it didn't go far enough. Thanks, Ted. <laughs> How'd that work out for you? Um, I, I, I can see how in the heady 70s, though, you might have thought uh, universal health care was just around the corner. Right. Um, but still, he should have taken what was on the table while it was on offer. Um, but yeah, no, I think Biden did want to be this FDR-like figure, not so much out of a deep caring for uh, the American public, but out of enormous wounds to his ego that he suffered, particularly according to... Uh, insider accounts as vice president in the Obama White House, where all of these Yaleys and Harvard people seem to treat them like the gum under their shoe, according to what they, you know, which makes it, you could see it in the way Obama dealt with him when he visited the White House a few months ago. Right, right, right. Exactly. And he's the president. Like he didn't even have the good grace to play act. 
that <laughs> deference. Right, 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 know? right, right. It's like, yeah, you got, uh, it was a go get your fucking shine box <laughs> attitude, like, like all the way through. Um, so, you know, I, I think he genuinely wanted to pass bigger things. But when you when you read these articles, and I, I've said this before, I don't think the elite class of the United States has ever been this disconnected from the public. I don't even think during the Gilded Age was the elite class this completely clueless about public taste, public attitudes. You know, I'll watch, um, I watch some of these uh, sites that critique, um, you know, uh, movies and comic books and books. And something they'll very often show are the Rotten Tomato scores, where this happens a lot, where you have 100% critic ratings and like 16% audience ratings. This happens quite a bit. I don't know that there's ever been a time in American history where the disconnect would be that great between elite class opinions and everybody else. And, and, and that's really what you see in an article like this. I mean, this is the woman well, yeah, we who didn't think that there would be anything weird about writing about the Speaker of the House's shoes and perfect manicure, <laughs> you know, whatever, whatever she went on there with her Pelosi profile, where she, she went on, you know, it was, it was like describing a character in Sex and the City. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like, mean, I think what, what, what cut, cut to Speaker of the House. <laughs> Where, I mean, wearing I think perfect Blonix. I, I, I'm, I will be repeating myself slightly here, but I think what says it even more than that is that that line, this idea that the country needed calming after Donald Trump, as if the average person spent their days and nights obsessing over every offense of Donald Trump. You, I mean, not like I said. I mentioned the warehouse job I worked because it's the only job I've had in many, many years where I worked in the presence of other people. <laughs> I've either worked alone in my room or alone in my car, which is where I work now. My warehouse gig was where I was exposed to 50 or 60 other people. You know how many conversations I heard about what a vulgar and offensive person Donald Trump is? Zero. Zero. The idea that ordinary people were having a hard time coping with the bad form that Donald Trump brought to the White House. That is such an elite take. That is an incredibly privileged take. Not the country was perfectly calm. The country was perfectly calm. You hysterical morons were the ones who needed to calm down. Yeah. And you needed to calm down by actually, I don't know, reading a thing or two, or maybe sort of jogging your memory about, say, hmm, Dick Cheney, who's now doing ads for his daughter, who's the new hero. Of the, <laughs> you know, this week's hero of MSNBC, Dick Cheney calling Donald Trump a coward. Donald Trump is the single greatest threat this republic has ever faced. I mean, it's beyond parody. It's beyond parody. Um, but anyway, I think just that claim, that well, claim well, just well, says well, it, all. well, this because really... it also misreads the needs of the moment. No, the country didn't need to. The country didn't need to calm down. The country needed a new social contract. It's the exact opposite of what she writes. The exact right. opposite of what she writes is what she should have written. And that's how you know how out of touch they are. That says it all right there. Well, you're right. I mean, it, it was really their class that was hysterical. Yeah, they were the they, ones who were their, cl their class and aspirants to their class and people under the illusion that they're part of their class. Ba basically, anyone in that media bubble was hysterical. And it was during, so crazy. during During all four years of Trump's administration. But to me, and I, I think to any reasonable person watching... You lose all credibility when at the same exact moment that you're exoriating Donald Trump as a unique evil, you are rehabilitating George W. Bush and now Dick Cheney. You, you, at that point, everything you say about Donald Trump has to be thrown out the window. You're not a serious person if you can praise those people or even defend them or say, I had somebody who was at, completely in that tell me that um george bush was an honest republican you could have honest disagreements with how short a memory do you do you have to have do you do you remember i mean george bush was what donald trump became to them like was it amped up a little bit because trump wouldn't play act 
like Bushwood. Yeah, I guess. But they were pretty, you know, convinced that George Bush was a threat to democracy and truth. Remember truthiness, right? I mean, that that came from them. That the the first presentation of this idea that you know truth is is a flexible concept that it's not necessarily a fixed um, objective uh, thing, but we can alter what the truth is with what we say it is. That came from the Bush administration. And rightly, there were a lot of press articles talking about how terrifying that was. Do you remember, I mean, everybody knows about Katrina 2005, obviously the Iraq war defined his time in mm. office, but even pre 9-11, not a lot of people even remember this because anything, you know, post election 2000, pre 9-11 is just sort of memory hold. Right. Do you remember it was it should have been a much bigger scandal than it was, if not for 9-11, where the White House, the Bush White House actually edited their own EPA's reports to take the words climate change out of them. To minimize, was, it, was that the Bush administration? Yes, that was the Bush administration. Oh, so wow. even even yeah. taking away all the scandals that they're famous mm -hmm. for, just pick a random date over those eight years, <laughs> and you'll find just horrifying <laughs> shit that they did to not only bend the truth. We talk about you know how Trump was this Orwellian figure, and not only expand executive power far more than Trump did. I mean, if Bush and his gang were president during COVID, they would have expanded the powers of the presidency to to no end whereas donald trump you could argue actually shrank those powers during COVID. he did not use COVID as pretext to expand his own powers the way that certainly dick cheney would have i mean there's well, no question well, about that wasn't um did weren't there more officials prosecuted under george w bush than any previous president which i'm sorry what was that i was looking w at the chat weren't, weren't there more officials prosecuted under george w bush than any previous president because that was a big thing they kept figure, talking about when, me. when Obama got elected. Wow, look how, how much cleaner his administration is. Look how scandal-free his administration is compared to Bush's until they needed to make Bush a foil to Trump and rehabilitate him. Please clap.